Mick Spencer is a business owner on a mission. He founded On The Go Custom Apparel at the ripe old age of 22, which has seen 80 to 120% growth year on year. The Prime Minister visited his office just yesterday and his book is about to be launched. I just trusted the process and it was a big trust because I had no money in the bank. I transferred money to a factory in China I'd never met before and I said yes to a customer I'd never met. But I just thought, well, you know, what's the worst that can happen? (laughs) And let's go for it. It's the award-winning small business big marketing show thanks to American Express. Welcome to a small business marketing show where successful small business owners share their souls to take your marketing straight to the lead. Now, here's your host, Mr. Tim Bull. And welcome back to your weekly dose of marketing cunningness. Try and say that quickly. Now, I'm your host, Timbo Reed, but you, so much more importantly, you're a motivated business owner and you're ready to crank out some great marketing to build that beautiful business of yours into the empire it deserves to be. Today's 436th episode is made possible thanks to American Express to see how you can turn your existing expenses into some seriously good rewards. Google Amex Business after the show. Big show today. Young entrepreneur Mick Spencer shares how he's built on-the-go custom apparel into a multi-million dollar global powerhouse. Listener Dr. Ty Belknap shares one big marketing idea he successfully implemented from this show. And this week's jingle of the week would probably make the Beach Boys vomit. (laughs) Well, maybe not vomit, but cringe at the very least. As per usual, team, there is marketing G-O-L-D dripping from the ceiling over here at Small Business Big Marketing's HQ. So let's get stuck right in. By the age of 27, Mick Spencer had become a globally recognised CEO, a multi-millionaire entrepreneur and an investor. Sir Richard Branson said, and I quote, Mick Spencer is a future business leader to watch. End quote. Now, Mick's the founder and CEO of On The Go Custom Apparel, a multi-million dollar global e-commerce company that enables users to design and manufacture their apparel and accessories. I think you're going to love this chat. See, Mick is on a mission to disrupt the world of sporting apparel. He's built some incredible partnerships with the likes of Wes Farmers, one of Australia's biggest publicly listed companies. Our Prime Minister, don't know which one, I've lost track, was visiting him only yesterday after this interview and his book launches next week. I started off by asking Mick how he came to be sitting alongside Sir Richard on a conference panel just four years into starting on the go. Oh, it was uh, one of the best days of my life, I think. Uh, I, was, I was luckily chosen through a LinkedIn competition uh, to sit with Richard Branson and four other future business thinkers at the University of Queensland uh, Future of Business Summit. So, I mean, I got three hours next to him on a panel and then about two, three hours actually hanging out with him out the back talking about the business and, uh, yeah, learning a bit about the master of the man. What was your biggest takeaway? I think the biggest takeaway was you've just got to continue to back yourself of everything and invest in yourself as a person. Um, and, and that was a huge thing that Branson was, you know, very focused on throughout his career is he knew that if he backed himself, that would form the foundations of building a great team, you know, keeping his mind clear to disrupt certain industries, um, and also the premise of actually building a great team as well. That's what I took you know, massively from that. Interesting. I just interviewed a, a mental health advocate for small business owners in Australia, and one of her key bits of advice was to invest in yourself before you need it. So actually, obviously similar to what Sir Richard was saying. Absolutely agree. I think it's, it's one of the hardest careers you could ever choose, right, being a business owner. Um, being this sexy entrepreneur that people put tags on. Uh, It's lonely at the top, they say, and it's real, right? Um, The the grind is real, and it's never what people see in in the public eye. Uh, Have you been called a sexy entrepreneur or just an entrepreneur, Mick? Let's get that clear right up front. (laughs) 
just an average entrepreneur, mate. <laughs> I love it. Hey, speaking of name dropping, and Mick Jagger once said to me, never drop a name, uh, you've also got the Prime Minister coming into your office tomorrow. Yeah, uh, it was a crazy <laughs> afternoon. I mean, we always say to the team here, never, you know, there's always a surprise here. But, uh, but yeah, we just got approached through the Vet- Veteran Affairs uh, Council in the PM's office. And one of our fantastic sales reps, <laughs> who's been with the business for three years. He was actually a former military officer and a massive advocate for veteran affairs. And uh, mm-hmm. they want to use the company as a, as a case study on the news. So we've uh, just been madly organising the warehouse and the showroom and, and the team and, uh, and and getting everyone aligned for it. So that should be a bit of fun. Mate, that, that is awesome. I, I've talked about this on the show before, but there is a certain companies, certain types of businesses become media darlings and I've watched a bit of the of some of the interviews you've done and you've got some good media coverage is, is is this something you've worked on or is it just sort of falling at your lap this media coverage that on the go seem to be getting yeah we've definitely worked on it we definitely see it as a below the line strategy to build brand awareness I think in our industry when I started the company I realized that there was no real leaders at at, you know, in, behind a lot of the businesses in our in our game that wanted to put their name on their business, and I thought, well, that's a great opportunity. And it was one of the actual things that Richard Branson always told me: you know, one of the cheapest forms of marketing is put your own name out there. And uh, so we we have focused on it a lot. When you say putting your name out there, do you mean Mick Spencer or do you mean on the go? Well, I think both of them. I've I've always been, you know, I got into my business because I wanted to find a career that intersected purpose with people, the planet, and profit. And when I started on the go, I could join all those together. So I was also passionate about empowering and connecting others. And I find PR a great way to get your story across. I had some health challenges as a teenager. I wanted other teenagers to hear that. I wanted other business owners to be empowered by that. And I thought that it's a great brand builder as well. So we've kind of equally focused on PR for on the go and and myself. Um, because it's it's you know I think that as business owners we learn off what we what we can read, um, and uh, and particularly others. Yeah, and look, I even to the fact that you've got your own personal website, which I think is mixspencer dot com. Correct me if I'm wrong, but that is a um. I, I think all business owners should be building their personal brand at some level. Be blogging about things that are important to you. You know, if you want to be a speaker, you know, public speaking is a great way of promoting your business. I've had many guests on the show who are masters of that. So good on you for doing that. Let's talk about how on the go came into being. You failed school. You managed somehow to get into university two years later. And that's where the first iteration of on-the-go custom apparel was born in 2012. What did that look like? Yeah, so I was a young punk, 22-year-old at university. And uh, after kind of <laughs> volunteering in Hawaii at a kids' camp teaching poor kids sport and leadership, I realised that I just wanted to get into something that got people into sport uh, and activity. But I also loved the internet. I loved merchandise and I loved technology. Uh, so at university, I started printing some T-shirts for some friends' soccer teams, and a large customer approached me through one of those orders, and they'd pre-sold 500 cycling kits, and the procurement manager left without ordering them, and they needed them in three and a half to four weeks, and no one in the world could manufacture such technical products in less than 12 weeks. So stupidly committed to the order, and um, you know, quote unquote, walked up to mum in the living room saying how do you reckon we'll go producing these kits? And she said, Mick, you can't even tie the buttons on your polo shirt, let alone manufacture these items. You're crazy. Um, You know, as luck has it, when there's a will, there's a way. We figured out that this was a massively stagnant industry and made it happen and then realised, you know, there was much, you know, a lot more customers who had the same problem. What what, can you reflect back? uh, It's a few years ago now, but um, can you reflect back on what made you say yes to something that you thought you couldn't do? I think it was the excitement of starting before I was ready and just that passion to feed a hungry yes. crowd. And I saw this customer in a massive problem and I just wanted to solve it for them. I always loved customer service like that. So you get your first customer. It was a $50,000 order, I think. Is that right? And you've delivered it somehow. How did you deliver it? I mean, I had to learn how to be everything. A graphic designer, pattern maker, importer, freighter, uh, Sublimation expert, everything. And, you know, I was lucky that as a kid I had ADD and when I wanted to focus, I could. And, um, and, and you know, 
I was just, I just trusted the process. And it was a big trust because I had no money in the bank. I transferred money to a factory in China I'd never met before. And I said yes to a customer I'd never met. But I just thought, well, you know, what's the worst that can happen? <laughs> and let's go for it. Well, how old were you then? 22. So like, yeah, not, not a lot of downside, really. Great experience. So what's the first year look like? You get your first customer, you deliver on it. Um, all, is all a bed of roses going forward, Mick? No, I mean, what, what we just did, Tim, was I, I figured that and then I always had this strategy where it was like, you know what, if I've done that and I've done my time and learned the process with that category and that product, now I can expand it and do it again and again and again. And I actually realized that the great thing about selling such a large basket size, like like 500 units, was that you've actually then closed 500 people. And if you play your marketing right, yes. then out of those 500 people, I might reach 10% of them in a qualified way. And that was 50 new leads. So I just focused on being the master of that one category, which was cycling apparel. And then all of a sudden, those people who wore that product had businesses, had other sports teams, and they wanted to then use the same service. And that's, I, just, I expanded the first few years of the business literally just based on what customers wanted and where they were finding the biggest problems in the industry. Genius! How did you how did you actually do that? Were you actively ringing customers and saying, "What do you need? What are the problems that you've got? What can we do to help solve them?" I mean, I was ringing, I was emailing, I was driving my shitty Ford Laser from Canberra to Sydney to Melbourne to to, to regional areas, sit down with people. I just felt like this huge privilege to have one customer. And then when I had ten, I wanted a hundred. And then and then you know that's when you have this huge passion for a customer. I realized that there was a lot of companies out there that weren't listening to the customer's needs. And just actually by asking the question, which isn't hugely innovative or techy or amazing, just really simple stuff, um, you can actually build a really basic fundamental business. Uh, so, yeah. Do you th- you, I love what you said before, Mick, about um, feeling hugely privileged to have just one customer. Do you think that enough business owners think that having a customer is a privilege? Yeah, I think, you know, we get so caught up in in running a business, and I say this so frequently to my customer service team, that we work so hard to win one customer. And 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 in, in, in one moment of, of messing it up, you can lose them for life. And then if you lose them or you mess it up, they can mm-hmm. tell 10 other people and you can do more damage. So I think it's so important. And we acquire new customers every single day in our business. But we, we must focus constantly on those existing customers we have. And I think a lot of business owners take it, you know, too easy. Um, because But we live in a world now where people are growing up smarter, quicker, faster than all of us. So we have to be careful. Mm. Yeah, good point. Uh, let's just go through those first couple of years of the business because I know you've had a lot of wonderful moments in the on-the-go business. But just talking about some of the tough times, you ran out of cash at one point. What happened there? Oh, look, I think that every growth company is in a cash flow crisis, right? Um, You know, so, uh, you know, I think that fundamentally my father always taught me protect your risk and when you're taking a risk for a customer, make sure that they're covering you. And, you know, stupidly, some early lessons on, I I thought I'd change the business slightly. And the business was very innovative because we're a cash upfront business. We take money from a customer or deposit. We make the goods and freight the goods. And no stock holding, cash flow positive, all the signs of a great business. Um, but you know, in early years on, you're trying to fund, do you know, you're trying to fund growth. You want to fund these big new contracts and continually evolve the business without investor capital in those first three years. Uh, and I stupidly decided for a great big customer to hold stock, which was something that we just never did. We're an on-demand, customized product company, and we held stock for a large company, and they pulled the contract from us. Uh, about a month into holding that stock, and it almost wiped us. And, uh, you know, so you've got to really, business owners, especially ones like me who have bright, shiny syndrome, as my chairman calls it, you have to be careful, right? You've got to focus on fundamentally what your core business is. Really be careful when you deviate away from that. Bright, shiny syndrome. I'm just writing that one down. Tell me more about that. You're easily distracted. I suppose with ADD, you're going to be kind of jumping between ideas. I think in the early years you are, right? Because it takes you so long to figure yeah. out what you what you actually do. Like, what do you do and what is your business model? I think it's very different for me now. I have a team of almost 40 people, um, a multi-million dollar turnover, you know, shareholders that are some of the biggest companies in Australia. So I've got a very different job now. 
I need to stay innovative and forward thinking, but I, but I'm a, le- a lot less bright and shiny because I have a bigger responsibility. But in those early days, you kind of just go where the opportunity comes from, and that's good and bad, right? In the same sentence. Thanks to American Express for chatting with Mick Spencer, who is the founder of On the Go Custom Apparel. Mick, um, what do you think was the one thing? Is it was there one thing that really gave On the Go? the kick it needed to take it to a level where you thought, hang on, this is going to be a serious business? Yeah, I think there's been a couple, Tim, and a couple of different stages. Um, Early on, it was that first order. That got me to drop out of university. And then it was about finding my first great staff member who really helped me evolve my thinking with having staff. Um, About four years into the business, we're on Shark Tank, and we got the largest deal on Shark Tank in season two. Uh, I went in to pitch for 300000 walked out with 600000 and had sold my 30% of my company to the Sharks on the show. Uh, and that was, you know, 1.1 million people watching. And that was that next boost at that point. Um, I didn't end up following through with them to bring them on as shareholders, but that was, you know, millions of dollars of publicity. Who, who were the Sharks out of interest? We got Janine Ellis, we got Steve Baxter, and we got Andrew Banks. They were all great people, right, still okay. keep in touch with them. Uh, and we had a great show. We were the first. We were the first pitch on this on the season, um, and they, the TV put us in the in the light in a really positive way, and I was ever thankful for that um, because we couldn't afford it, that that media coverage. Right, twelve minutes of curated primetime television is a lot. And 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 season two too, when it was kind of just finding its feet, did you get a whole lot of business as a result of being on Shark That's Tank? Huge. I mean, we had about three hundred thousand people hit the site over about a seven day period. We had tons of publicity. We were like a poster child overnight. I was walking through airports. People are going, hey, you pitch on Shark Tank. It was, it was really great. And, you know, our product lends uh, itself uh, so well to Aussie homes because everyone knows someone who's a small business owner or a sports team or, you know, someone who can order custom apparel for their cause. So it was a fantastic uh, legway. And then that was the uh-huh. next step. And then, you know, from there, most recently, partnering up with West Farmers was, was that next kind of wow moment. So... I think that you refresh your wow moments at each stage, and what we've done in, I guess we've had a, we've had about an, you know an average of between eighty and one hundred and twenty percent growth year on year since we started. Each new stage, we've been re inspired about where the business actually can be, and that and and that's not just from myself and my dreams, but proper people who have built big businesses. So that's exciting. Sure is, eighty to one hundred and twenty percent growth year on year. Yes, it can get tiring. I tell you. Well, we better talk about uh, – we'll talk about work-life balance at the end. The Wes Farmers joint venture, Mick, that's incredible. So Wes Farmers, maybe describe to our overseas listeners who Wes Farmers is and how that JV came about. Yeah, we were approached by um, the head of their industrials division who was actually Richard Branson's former CEO of 10 years. And this is a really good story about you, you should always trust that the dots will connect because – in this instance, it really did for me. And by way of meeting Richard Branson, I met David Baxby, who was the head of industrial, who in the last 12 months has become head of industrials and safety at West Farmers. And he knew our tech and our platform and our business. And, and under his responsibility, he'd, he'd acquired um, Workwear Group, which is Australia's largest uniform company. So he just put two and two together where, he, you know, at, at Virgin, he just spent his whole kind of career going around, uh, around the world and doing JVs with, with with startups and then putting Virgin badge on it and building a great team that way. Um, so you know it was it was a good marriage of that. Amazing. And and what what's the JV brought to on the go? So look, we've done a joint venture with Workwear Group, who's the owners of King G Hardacker and NNT Uniforms. Essentially, they have uh, one of the largest uniform businesses in the Southern Hemisphere, and they've got some digital inefficiencies that we're able to fill with our software. Um, and, and, you know, they've, they've got, they want to become more and more relevant to their customer, but it was essentially, you know, building something like what we do was going to be difficult for them. And their, their factories are used to long runs, high minimums, long turnaround, whereas we're all about short run, quick turnaround. So they've white labeled our software, given it to their field team of 250 salespeople, um, with a, with a thick kind of sales target. And they're, they're hitting the road selling our product to, the big banks, the big airlines, and and industrial and and small customer, small business customers all over Australia. They've white labelled your the technology, which you've sunk a lot of dough into. How do you make a quid then from a Wes Farmers? Is there a split of commissions when something gets sold? Yeah, so 
between us, we have a two-year sales target that they have to meet. And then equally on the back of that, we, we get uh, the majority split of those revenues. And then we get paid a license fee per use of, of product. And then equally, we're working together to build out our business and their business and now taking it into office works and then other larger companies as well who want to offer this type of product in their store or their network. We're talking to Mick Spencer, founder of On The Go Apparel. Uh, at, at the heart of that business, Mick, obviously it's an online ordering system that is available to sporting clubs and small businesses um, all over the world, from what I can gather. What caught my eye when uh, I first came across your story was the fact that I think it was an article I read somewhere where you are putting vending machines into office work stores around Australia. So now really small businesses can just walk in and get some brand or order some branded apparel through a vending machine. How's that work? Yeah, so it's a it's an invention called the customization station. And and what I wanted to do was rather than just being a typical e com company, I wanted to give my customers a much broader approach to ordering and I know that they want to feel fabric, try on garment, but but get that experience in store. So partnering up with Officeworks and a few other little retailers in Australia, we're installing these kiosks over the next two to three years where people will be able to go in, try on garments, touch and feel fabrics, be inspired by other people have designed and then actually design their own uniform or their own uh, sports team's gear within an Officeworks, um, transfer their logo from their phone place the order in that store, get it delivered to their home or, or to their or, or back to the office work store. I don't think Australia, from what I can tell, and I haven't been to Japan, but I hear Japan are nailing vending machines, whereas vending machines over here sort of were a bit behind the game, but clearly you're, you're challenging that. We are in Australia. I think we're pretty protected. And, you know, you go to Asia, you go to Europe, it's just kind of common sense and just, you know, it's not innovative over there um, because, it, you know, it's just what you've got to do to survive. But I think Australia is really starting to. We're seeing some big changes in in different um, formats of e-com, wanting to go more omni-channel. And I think it's just that, you know, this whole hype of retail is dead. It's not dead. You know, it's so far from dead. People want to go in stores. People want to go online. They just want experience. That's that's the key theme here. So that's where we're focused, yeah. Yeah, experience is big. I know it's a bit of a buzzword, but uh, it makes a whole lot of sense when we live in a world of parity. I was saying on an episode recently, you know, there's no shortage of any type of business in any type of industry. So what's going to set us apart? And often the customer experience is is one of those things. Let's talk marketing. You say you've got a relentless, a relentless ethos of making it happen. You said to the customer. Do you want to explain that ethos? Yeah, sure. So um, look, the, we, we have uh, one of our key values at OTG is go beyond in service and delivery. And and making it happen, the way the way we see that is we were entering an industry where people design branded products for their business or their or an event or a really important cause. And there was there was competitors happy to deliver one week, two weeks, three weeks late and, and just say to the customer, Well, kind of suck it up, that's how it is. Whereas for me, I just didn't I just didn't think that was fair. So we've just got this huge mantra towards our DIFOT score, which is delivering full on time. And and that is what we do. I mean, I had a rep today driving a, a, a box down from from Sydney um, Airport, someone in regional Australia, uh, about a three hour drive because that was going to be the quickest way to get it there for this customer. It's something we had on tonight, and that that story runs through the business every other day. Um, and we want to be known for that. You know, it's a challenging industry because of the way products are made and still it fail. So we we fail as well. But we're, we're so passionate about that we must make it happen for the customer and continue in that drive as we grow, uh, you know, and not getting too boring. Well, and that having, having that ethos too, I'm guessing, Mick, is just going to create wonderful word of mouth where people go, you're not going to believe what happened, but Mick and his team at On The Go had someone drive down and this and that and the deadline and, you know, people are going to talk. Correct. And that's, I mean, it, the power, the most powerful piece of marketing is word of mouth, right? And and we're in reviews and 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 what people say. That's the undisputable truth of the business. So that's why we invest in that. You know, and that's why we have no qualms with investing resources to make something happen for the customer because that's that's our focus. We want to nail this industry. Uh, it's a huge industry globally. We we want to be the best here and we're very category focused. We want to be real the best specialist in this area. Um, and we think that's going to be a big business. And and you've so you've got to back up what you say. 
you know, and it doesn't happen all the time, must I add, right? So you can easily say that you're the best of the best, but it doesn't happen all the time. And me and my head of commercial are often on the phone to customers when things have messed up. And that's, that's also a part of it, right? Sure. Part of an opportunity to grow, you know? Exactly. Being transparent with a customer, telling them that, you know, you've had growing pains, you're here to solve it, what can we do? And sometimes, you know, we have people design serious stuff on our platform. I mean, you know, we have stories where someone's doing a running festival for their sister who died of breast cancer. And, they're, and they're, you know, that, that's important stuff, right? Um, people, are, people are investing heavily in branded products to promote a new product for, for Samsung or Microsoft that's going to market at a conference. I mean, you can't mess that stuff up. So it's very critical product that we sell. What's your overall view on marketing? How important is it to your business? And what's the best marketing you've done, Mick? Um, marketing, I think, well, I have, we, we call it customer acquisition or demand creation is the, is the review we put on it. And, and we have, you know, this whole focus on, you know, seven to 12 uh, touch points of a customer. So there's obviously the above and the below the line on that, um, you know, and I think it's that whole adage of reach and frequency. You've really got to hit a customer multiple times across multiple channels to, to become front of mind. So I literally have a poster right in my office. We have it in every other room about the seven to 12 point strategy of an OTG customer journey, you know, and the, and the couple of months out from when we think they're going to order, it's the, it's the SEO, it's paid advertising, it's PR. It then gets into your, the consider stage where it's about referrals and blogs and, 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 and remarketing if they've come to the site. And then in that lead up to when we think they're going to order, it's really kind of, you know, we hope that we've, we've pulled them into the funnel and, and excited them through the internet and remarketed them and then and then and then really sending them a really personalized message that they feel that we are the right solution for them to order their their team kits on. So we we focus on it hugely. It's a big part of our business. Um, and we also track a lot of the economics, the underlying economics behind it as well. So we're constantly tracking our cost to acquire certain orders, certain categories, what's working and not working. Um, and once you really tweak that and understand it, you can actually start to really drive the volume up of your revenue um, because then just can become quite a quite a quite an easy narrative. You I've looked at your website and I just want to finish off this chat, Mick, by pulling your website apart a bit because I'm guessing you've put a lot of work into this website. You've got trust icons, you've got live chat, you have got the offer of a promo code that slightly vibrates. I almost feel like it vibrates when I look at it. They did it again. Um, <laughs> it doesn't know I'm looking at it, but um, maybe give us three to five little pointers. I mean, everyone listening has got a website for their business. Many are frustrated by it. What are some of the kind of user interface little trickeries that you've got going here that we can learn from? Oh, I mean, there's a lot in there, uh, as, as, you've, as you've alluded to. Look, we have developers watching uh, videos of, of, of every single user on the website. We have heat mapping software on there. Uh, we, we, we do a lot of A-B testing, so we'll serve different customers different things. And we want to make the site as relevant and as easy for the customer. We don't want them to waste their time. So we, we, we constantly have... I think, look, to break it down easy, um, I would say you have to identify who is the customer that's coming to the site. So we profile our small business customer. We profile our volunteer soccer mum customer. We profile our elite athlete customer. And then we think about how they want to entertain on the site. And often people think that they can build the sexiest website, but it can actually be shit for the customer. So you look at, look at some of the biggest websites on the planet. They're ugly, but they're easy to use. So I think that's one of the other things that I found interesting is let's not make it amazing. Let's just make it simple for what the customer wants. That's really true. I mean, again, looking at your website, you know, if you were to kind of be um, constructively critical, it's not the most beautiful, but it's, it just ticks a lot of boxes. Like I walk away from this website going, I would confidently buy from you. And clearly that's what the outcome you're looking for is. <laughs> Yeah, thank you. Great story. Hey, uh, Mick, um, I feel like, and I say this to the odd guest uh, that comes on this show, I feel like you are sort of in day one of On The Go. You've had some massive wins, joint ventures. You know, you've you've met the big fella in Branson. You've got the Prime Minister coming tomorrow. But uh, I feel like you've got a long way to go, and, and I wish you all the best with it, mate. Oh, mate, we really are just getting started, yeah. And <laughs> we, we do have a long way to go. Yeah, absolutely. We'll be watching with interest. Thanks, Mick. Thanks a lot, Tim. Thanks for having me. 
Well, there you go, team. Man on a Mission, Mick Spencer from On The Go Custom Apparel, which you will find at onthegosports.com.au if you want to have a look. I've also posted some pics of our PM at Mix Business. You can see them over at smallbusinessbigmarketing.com forward slash 436. Hey, be sure to hang around after my top three attention grabbers as this week's jingle of the week. Well, it's full of good vibrations. But first, my top three attention grabbers from that chat with Mick Spencer, thanks to our very good friends at American Express. Attention grabber number one. I just love Mick's overall drive and enthusiasm. You know, he's got the Prime Minister visiting, he's launching his first book, he's on the speaking circuit, he's not shy to generate media coverage, and he's running a multi-million dollar business with some serious partnerships. Love his drive and enthusiasm. Attention grabber number two. I really love Mick's philosophy around creating seven to 12 touch points before a prospect becomes a customer. And he even takes it one step further, as he said, by having created a poster that details those touch points posted all over the office. What a great reminder. You know, don't lose face when you face, don't lose face ever, don't lose faith when you go out with a couple of little marketing initiatives and you don't get much reaction. Remember, it does take people a long time before they come around thinking, oh, I think I'll buy from those guys. Personalize it. Think of how you operate in your own life when it comes to buy things. Obviously, the higher involvement the purchase decision, the longer it's going to take someone to decide. And attention grab at number three. Mick mentioned that he is someone within the business constantly following Google Trends. I think that is genius. It's a great way to keep on top of what's going on in your industry. Plus, it's a really good way, Google Trends that is, to get ideas for fresh, timely content. That's what grabbed my attention. Love to know what grabbed yours. Head over to smallbusinessbigmarketing.com forward slash 436. Come on down. It's Timbo's Monster Prize Draw. Oh, yes, in Deedly Doodly. It is that time of the episode where we reward a motivated listener for taking swift marketing action. I'll explain how you can enter this afterwards because I want to get to today's winner immediately. And today's winner is Dr. Ty Belknap from Port Bell which is a U.S.-based digital marketing agency based in Tacoma, Washington. Nice. Well done, Dr. Ty. Here's what he sent us. He says, Hello, Timbo. I've listened to almost every episode of Small Business Big Marketing, and I hope you'll forgive me for taking so long to write to you. Yeah, only nine years, Dr. Ty. That's okay. I'm okay. You've written. That's a good start. He goes on to say, I have learned a great deal from your podcasts and some of the marketing gold I've learned has enabled my business coaching business to grow a great deal. So he's got a business coaching business as well as the digital marketing agency. He says, I just finished listening to podcast 413 with Mia Klitsis from Moxie, which is the tampon subscription service. I just decided not to do a marketing campaign because I thought the message was a bit too pointed for some people, but Mia did some marketing that was very different from the other companies in her industry, marketing that had strong imagery. I took away a very clear idea, and that is, don't be afraid of a strong marketing message. Correct, Dr. Ty. Yes, it may turn away some people. That's okay. But those people may not be your target market. Correct. Nothing wrong with polarizing. I would rather have clients that have a sense of humor, so I have changed my mind and will be doing the new marketing campaign anyway, thanks to what Mia was talking about. Dr. Ty, you're onto something there. Don't try to be everything to everyone. You end up being nothing to no one. Be yourself, inject some personality, create marketing messages that may alienate your business from certain groups of people. That's okay. The marketing that does hit the people that you want it to will really stick. Thanks for your letter, Dr. Ty. You have won the Monster Prize draw, but because you're in the States, I can't send you anything. I've got to get some guests donating prizes that we can send overseas. But you did get some promotion on your sh- on the show. Portbell.com is where you will find 
Dr. Ty, see what he's up to. Plus, I'm going to give the good doctor a backlink on the Small Business Big Marketing website, which is priceless. So thanks, good doc. Hey, uh, everyone else, I'd love you to email me with one idea that you've implemented from listening to this show, what impact it's had on your business. If I read it on air, you win lots of prizes in the treasure chest, let me tell you. And uh, that's if I read it on air, you'll get one, two, maybe three prizes. And if it's the letter of the year, which I announce in December, you will win a hot lap in a racing Porsche with past guest and racing car legend who won Bathurst for the fifth time a couple of weeks ago, Steve Richards. That is valued at two and a half thousand dollars. Email me, Tim at timreed, reid.com.au. Okay, I think it's time for the jingle of the week. Now, I'm not sure how I feel about jingles that use the music from popular songs and just change the words. It's completely legal. I get that. All the brand needs to do is purchase the mechanical rights to the song and they can rewrite it. I get all that. But doesn't it ruin great songs like this one? The Good Guys, where you pay less when you pay cash. The Good Guys, pay less, pay cash. (laughs) Oh, gee. The Beach Boys, what would they be thinking? Well, I suppose they gave permission. How about pay less and don't use a popular song to promote your business? That'd be a better line. I don't know, what do you reckon? Am I being too harsh? Got to promote your business somehow, got to stand out. I guess having a popular track. Under you know, supporting your brand can be a good thing. I'll find some more jingles over the coming weeks that have killed popular songs. And if you know one, hit me up on Twitter at Timbo Reed, R-E-I-D. That almost wraps up another episode of the Small Business Big Marketing Show, sponsored by our great friends at American Express. Be sure to search Amex Business. You can do that now that the show's over to find out how your business expenses can reward you and which American Express card is right for you. Hey, got some great interviews coming up in the coming weeks, including one on mental health for small business owners. And in a few weeks' time, you and I are going to be masterclassed in search engine optimization tactics for 2019 by one of the world's leading experts. Be excited. Be very, very excited. Don't forget there's an entire back catalogue of interviews over at smallbusinessbigmarketing.com. If you love the show then let another business owner know about it by grabbing their phone, opening the podcast app, and doing what? That's right, downloading it for them. Until next week, I am Timbo Reed. Thanks for tuning in. May your marketing be the best marketing. Bye for now.